Good evening, everybody. Hello, welcome. Thank you for braving this very cold weather to come along to this UC Connect public lecture. Um, I have notes because Amy roped me into this just today, who is a colleague of mine. <laughs> so um, I just want to do a bit of housekeeping first. So if there's a, f oh, we have two hosts here tonight. Jess and Sarah is around here. She's out there. So these are our two hosts, the students at the university. So if there's a fire, can you please evacuate? And our hosts will give you instructions. If you need to use a bathroom, they're out to my right. If there is an earthquake, can you please stay in the building? And there's an assembly point out in the Clyde Road car park um, by the arts block. And there are security stations on campus should you need any to contact security at any point in time while you're on the campus. That's the housekeeping. So, my notes. Firstly, I'm Kate McRoberts. I'm not an academic. I am a colleague of Amy's, and I am here to build an artificial intelligence research centre and artificial intelligence qualifications with the academics. So that's the plug for that piece of work happening with the university. And tonight we're going to hear a 45 minute public lecture from Associate Professor Amy Fletcher. The compelling title, I must admit, it created quite a bit of curiosity for me. So Amy's um, a very good, publishes a lot. She's just finished a book, is that correct? Yes. So this is about emerging technology, about extending lifespans or creating immortality, and our access to that. And some of us may not have access to that because we're not billionaires. So the implications of that for us. And a little about Amy. So she's an Associate Professor of Political Science and International Relations. She is, she won't like me saying this, but she's wildly popular in her lecture theatres <laughs> because she teaches United States politics. So you can imagine. <laughs> and she's from the United States originally. So Amy's current interests are in emerging technology, in particular its impact uh, in AI, that's how we uh, work together. And in particular, its impact on the environment and higher education. And she does a lot of publishing in that space. She was a founding board member for the New Zealand AI Forum. And a little unknown fact about her, unless you read the bio, is that she grew up in Huntsville because her father was on the NASA program. So can we please give a warm welcome to Associate Professor Amy Fletcher. Can you hear me? Great, okay, it's not too loud, because I have one of those loud American voices. It's fantastic to see such a number of people coming out, as Kate said, on a cold, stormy night to attend a lecture here in the UC Connect Forum. Let me ask before we get started, do we have any physicists in the room? Okay, do we have any neuroscientists in the room? Do we have any I'm a skeptic in the room? <laughs> okay, fair enough, it's good that you're here. Do we have theologians? Anyone that works with people who are experiencing grief at the loss of a loved one? Okay. I wanna note at the very beginning, as Kate pointed out, what I do is science in society. I'm very interested in that link or that very flexible boundary, if you will, between science hype, science hope, science fiction, and science. And I'm also very interested in this particular cultural moment. Why immortality and why now? What's driving that? And finally, I also like to look at the way that the media tends to both amplify certain issues and then de-emphasize others. So in the talk today, and I'm happy to, and I'll try to leave about 10 minutes for questions and discussion, if there is any, and if you want to follow up with me, I'm easily found here at Canterbury, if you don't get a chance to ask a question. And two kind of boundaries I'm gonna put around the talk. I'm gonna focus primarily on the Western experience and the modern period. But one of the first things I noticed when I came to this topic, as you might have expected, I was thinking, oh, okay, I finished this project and now I need a new project that builds on that one. I know immortality. That'll be about three to five years. 
No. What I found out very quickly, as you probably could guess, is that it touches everything. It touches classics, it touches philosophy, it touches so many branches of science. Concerns about, questions about, an obsession with immortality, you find that threading through virtually every culture that has made up humanity over the millennia. So it's a very rich topic, and there's no way that we can do all of it in 50 minutes, but I do want to focus on the modern period, take a brief detour, starting with Mary Shelley through the late 19th and 20th centuries, and then move to our moment. Again, why immortality? Why now? What's driving this? And what might be the implications for those of us who aren't in Silicon Valley or who are not billionaires? So, staying with that then, so the first thing I want to talk about is the last exit, just some basic scientific and social objections to the whole notion of immortality. Then I want to look again at the cultural politics, picking up with Mary Shelley, disrupting death, the Silicon Valley model that everything is there to be disrupted. What does that mean? They've disrupted media, they've disrupted relationships, They've disrupted education. They've disrupted the financial system. Why not disrupt death? They're pretty used to accomplishing what they set out to do. So we'll stay with that and then finish by looking at this question of immortality for everyone else. Now, the reason these numbers are up on the board, you don't have to share, but I am going to circle back around to this with some data towards the end of the lecture. The Pew Research Foundation in the United States did very high quality survey and they asked regular people, what is your ideal lifespan? And you had four options, up to age 78, and that would be enough for me. That seems ideal. 79 to 100, 101 to 120, and for some, 120 plus, is that an appealing prospect? I know there's a lot of questions that would have to be asked there. How healthy am I going to be? How much money am I going to have? But putting those just aside for the moment, if you can sort of imagine in an ideal space, what would your ideal lifespan look like? So if you could think about that for yourself, where you would have answered that question, we're gonna circle back around to that here in a moment. So again, I just finished a project on de-extinction, and this is the book that's coming out later this year, and it was a very natural jump from de-extinction to immortality, both in terms of the science that's in question, but again, for someone who's interested in science and society, more to do with, is this real? And if it is real, how real is it? What kind of time frame are we talking about? Who stands to make money from this? Why bring back a woolly mammoth? What is the point of that, right? So all of these questions that sort of emerged in the de-extinction space, you find them writ large, if you will, in the immortality space. So if we look at some of the major objections, now I'm not going to go deeply into these, and all of these are subject to scientific debate. But as a general rule, science puts some very strict boundaries around the question of immortality. Well, we have the second law of thermodynamics, things fall apart, right? I mean, there's just, this is a fact, this is a thing that exists in our world that works against any kind of concept of immortality. In the early 1960s, when cellular immortality was becoming a preoccupation of scientists, Leonard Hayflick came up with Hayflick's limit. Actually, cells can divide many, many times, but there is, under normal circumstances, a limit. So no, they are not immortal in the sense that people were starting to think that they were in the early 1960s. Recently, a co-author team has published that it is mathematically impossible for immortality to happen. 
And in my own research, this is just one attempt to capture in a mind map. If we move from science to society, there are technical objections, there are environmental objections, there are quality of life and social objections. And I think Franz Kafka, as was his wont, kind of got to the heart of the matter here. Um, the meaning of life is that it stops. We don't even have to go into all the complexities of the second law of thermodynamics. We know, as human beings, uh, this is quite resonant to me, personally, well, it's the fact that there is an end to it that makes it worth doing. So then the social scientist in me got really curious. It seems that the arguments against immortality are pretty strong. So why, in 2019, is it even hitting media outlets like The Guardian? Why are we even talking about this again? I thought we were supposed to be that sophisticated 21st century cutting edge scientific society. And again, if you go through all the objections, it sort of leaves you with a question. So what is going on here? What is driving this? Because there's been a massive surge in the mass media over the last two or three years around investment in age extension. Companies, startups, venture capitals flowing. There's kind of an obsession with this idea of at least radical age extension, if not potential forms of immortality. So if we go back and we look at the modern era in the Western, British, and American particularly context, one pattern I noticed very quickly is that again, we could go back to Gilgamesh, we could go back to Lazarus, we could go back to so many myths and stories and religious beliefs. So immortality is sort of always one of those human preoccupations that's sort of humming in the background. But you'll notice moments like this one, once you start studying it systematically, where suddenly it's not just the background noise, it becomes very salient. It becomes very visible. And it began to dawn on me that one thing that connects these moments like ours to spaces where the question of immortality begins to really royal society, not just scientists, not just religious people, but sort of the whole culture are at moments in societies that are under great stress. So, Mary Shelley. I find the mere fact that she wrote the Frankenstein story to be an amazing thing. Can you imagine being around those egos that weekend, trying to be seen or heard? And obviously, I mean, it's everywhere. They've made serials of, you know, about it. It's pop culture, it's high culture, it's low culture, it's movies. So hats off to Mary Shelley. But if we think about this question of under stress, it wasn't just her personally. You can sort of see how it comes out of a particular milieu. What was this time frame, 1816, 1818? Well, the French Revolution, which starts with such promise, has devolved into a great deal of terror. There's sort of the romantic counter-reaction to the excesses of the Enlightenment. The realization that, yes, science brings with it a great deal of power, it brings with it progress, and it also brings with it some very dangerous potential. And she was also, anybody familiar with Galvani Aldini? She actually drew on the science of her time, because another thing to think about Mary Shelley's time is that notion that science is sort of in a box, and there's a very strict boundary between what science is and who gets to speak to it, the credentialed experts, and how they speak through their conferences and their peer-reviewed journal articles, that had not locked down yet. That's a very 20th century development. In Shelley's time, the boundaries between science, society, spectacle, entertainment, 
all of that was very fluid. And the whole culture was sort of drawn in to these new scientific findings, and particularly drawn in to, wait a minute, where is the boundary between life and death? We think that this is pretty solid, but hmm, maybe it's not quite as solid as we think. So one of the major inspirations on Mary Shelley was the work of Galvani Aldini, who sought to hold or sort of make sure that his uncle's work in animal electricity was respected and considered real science. But in order to do that, he experimented in front of huge groups of people, students, the public, whoever, the media, would take corpses, and in one particularly famous case, which Shelley quite maybe would have even seen, in 1803, he took a recently deceased convict who'd been brought immediately right, to his theater for his experiment, and he applied electricity. Now we know now, right, various reasons why that was not exactly reanimating the dead. But to the people of the time, the fact that the body started twitching, that it sat up, that its eyes opened, well suddenly that's why you get, I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but you've got, you know, Satan's minions over here. Well, we've lost him after all, see, they're bringing him to life again. So Mary Shelley, yes, Frankenstein's monster is sort of the paradigmatic modern icon of this whole discussion. You'll just see it repeated in news articles, even scientific journals, right? It's the go-to metaphor in the way that Jurassic Park is the go-to metaphor for people studying de-extinction. But it comes out of, again, a very vibrant milieu in which that boundary between life and death was seen increasingly, not that the spiritual went away, but the scientific is coming in. And those sorts of experiments that Aldini did were quite captivating to people at that time. Ah, oh, the Edwardian era, so now let's jump ahead. Here was another society under great stress. A certain era was ending, another one's about to be born. God himself couldn't sink the Titanic, we were told. That proved not to be true, All right? So if you look at the Edwardian era, again, you see this sort of repetition. There's an emphasis in locking down what science is, making science be distinct from spectacle. These questions around life and death and where the boundaries are become very salient again. And obviously, the great stressor here would have been World War I. If you think about the scale of the carnage, which in certain respects was unprecedented. If you think about what people were truly trying to process, it arguably makes perfect sense, even though to many of us now it looks like quackery, that spiritualism became a major preoccupation, particularly of women who had lost their sons. So spirituality, spiritualism, contacting the other world was actually taken quite seriously to the consternation of certain scientists, but it was taken quite seriously, again, as a sort of cultural, emotional, psychological response to the scale of the death that they had faced. As we move into the 1930s, this belief in immortality or this search for immortality, would be a better way of putting it, starts to dovetail with a futuristic interest in space exploration. I actually found through the Gutenberg Project, you can find it for free, it's been digitized, an old copy of the Jameson Satellite, which was a story released in 1931, in which a Mr. Jameson wants to live forever, so in an early form of cryogenics, he freezes himself, then he launches himself in a rocket, and 40 million years later, he's discovered by extraterrestrial entities, brought back to life, and as you see here, 
you know, the language of this, even for such a kind of quotidian sort of science fiction novel, you almost can't help but kind of fall into this kind of poetic language. He would remain intact and as perfect in its rocket container as on that day of the far gone past when it had left Earth to be hurled out on its career. So as we move into the 30s, we start to see that space and immortality become quite linked in the popular imagination, certainly within the science fiction community, which is starting to flourish in this time frame. Well, if we think about today, just pause for a second. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Has anyone noticed that space suddenly seems to be everywhere again? India is launching rockets, New Zealand's getting into commercial space exploration. So again, these moments in time may seem very fragmented, but you do start to see certain patterns, and again, not the least of which is a society under great stress. So before we move into the contemporary era, I want to talk about the 1960s. Has anybody had a chance to read this? This came out in 1962. Mr. Edinger had been a science fiction writer, and then he just decided to go for it and became a science entrepreneur and started the whole notion that cryonics, the freezing of the body or the freezing of the head, was sort of an insurance policy while we waited for science to catch up. What? Now, I don't think it's any accident, again, why does immortality, it's always there, it's not that it ever quite goes away as a cultural or literary preoccupation you know, it's so embedded in our myths, it's just sort of in the air that we breathe. But again, at these certain moments, so if you think about the early 60s, well, what reality is catching up to people? It's mutual assured destruction and the potential for nuclear obliteration of the planet. So again, the cryonics issue, while many laughed and many scoffed, there was a moment where it sort of permeates popular culture ranging from, if you have not seen this movie, please do, it is available in the public domain. Has anyone seen it? You can see all of it on YouTube. It's a great way to spend a rainy Sunday afternoon, the brain that would not die. And like a lot of the best drive-in movie kind of popcorn fiction, even though some of it is just silly, I mean, if you're just gonna put on a scientific set of glasses, it's gonna look kind of silly to you, but it actually, you can sort of see it churning through in that way that Mary Shelley's work did, kind of churning through more effectively than scholars can sometimes, the things that were really preoccupying people, right? And I don't think it's any accident, I'm not giving anything away. You, the movie starts with a big black screen, you don't even see the title yet, and you hear a very distressed woman's voice saying, let me die, let me die. So you can kind of see where this is gonna go. So again, these limits that the popular culture keeps wanting to put on these sort of scientific ideas, fantasies, innovations, depending on your standpoint as to how realistic this was. In 1967, the first body in the United States does, it is donated to a cryogenic institute and this particular image I find quite haunting. It was a reenactment for Life magazine which would have reached virtually every American home in the 1960s. And while that's a reenactment, I think it's quite an evocative. So again, in the 60s, we're now to cryogenics as a preoccupation with all of the stress and again, the mutual assured destruction, again, this huge fear that on the one hand, we have all this great scientific possibility, we'll even conquer death. At the same time, we sort of know in the back of our mind, if you go back through the Cold War and the cultural anxieties around nuclear annihilation. So now we can move into our moment. Because as you see here, this is from 2016, so many of the things, animal magnetism, cryonics, they have their moments where they're taken quite seriously, but of course, by the time you get to the 80s or 90s, most of that's been dismissed as quackery. 
So again, now we're back to, okay, but why is it coming back around? Why are serious people starting to bring these ideas back into circulation? So in terms of our moment, this notion of disrupting death, what you will find in the United States, there really aren't that many mega billionaires. There's Jeff Bezos, who, by the way, had to give half of his fortune to his wife when they divorced and still has $80 billion. <laughs> so that tells you something. Elon Musk, right, Sergey Brin. There are not that many of them, but as you might expect, they tend to punch well above their weight class, not just because of their money, but because of what that money gets you, which is access to the media, and access to political power. So while they themselves are not a particularly large group of people, there is a sort of transhumanist moment, the transhuman notion that we are now to use our technologies, we are at that point where technology does give us the power and the possibility of again at least extending our age, if not conquering, if you will, the question of death altogether. So, it is important, as it always is important with these cutting edge scientific topics, there is a range from the probable to the very fantastic or the very kind of cutting edge futuristic much of the investment currently going on, to be fair, has to do with the health span. It's not necessarily about extending life beyond, say, 85. It's about making that life healthier and more vibrant for as long as possible. And many critics of some of the more fantastic immortality research, okay, that there's still some questions around that perhaps in terms of prioritization of research funds and the like, but that tends to not be all that politically loaded. But then you move into life extension, radical or extreme life extension, which would be 120 years and beyond. And again, those who at least consider the possibility of some form of immortality. So some of the possibilities on offer, again, we may have people in here who because of their interests, their training, their background could speak you know, deeply to any one of these. In terms of kind of just looking at some of the things we're being told are possible, nanobots, Google executive believes that we will have nanobots in our bloodstream that can get right to the source, a diseased organ or deteriorating cells and repair them in real time. And that this would create quite a bit of age extension. We have Elon Musk and his neural lace. What if it's not physical immortality? Now some of what in the community they like to call the meat puppets, which I think is quite gross, but within the community, there are those who focus specifically on the biological body, that that is what you want to keep alive, that is what you want to keep vibrant. There are some who say no, 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 we now live in a digital world. You've got to open up your mind and rethink what immortality might look like, because maybe what matters is what's up here. And if you could connect that to the machine and literally download your consciousness, your memories, your identity, would that perhaps be a form of immortality? Aubrey de Grey definitely believes that we are on the verge with enough money and enough dedication to actually being able to extend the physical body because we will be able to re-engineer the process of cellular aging. What if we harvest stem cells from human placentas and inject them into older people? 
And I will note, by the way, my students were just gobsmacked in my class on science and society. Until the Food and Drug Administration shut it down recently, there was a Silicon Valley company that was buying the blood of 20-somethings to sell to Silicon Valley billionaires. Many people called it the Vampire Project, and they were paying. If you were willing to give your blood, you could get eight to 12,000 US dollars for it. And then they would charge that much more, and people bought it, looking, that's quite vampiric in my opinion, but, right? So this search, this desperate search for some to live as long as possible, and then maybe it's 3D printing. Maybe we'll be able to use cellular material in our printers and just print new organs and just keep going the way you replace parts in your car. So, it's also important to note, you always know that something important is happening in Silicon Valley when the money starts to flow. And we won't go deeply into that, but as you can see here, we've got tech funds, venture capital funds, and startup incubators and private equity funds. And in 2018, it looks like it will top out beyond this this year. But in 2018, investment in longevity reached 850 million US dollars, and it's climbing. So this is one of the hottest areas for people that have money to risk on technological possibilities. This, to me, though, gets right to the heart of the matter. One of the things I look at when I study science and society is how people talk about issues. And I love looking for metaphors, right? And I was at a conference recently, and it was a conference on grief and it was a conference on healthy aging. And I thought it was very impressive work, but it was about recognizing mortality, recognizing it physically, recognizing it psychologically, emotionally. And you could just see the tension in the room when one younger postgrad stood up and said, I just think you've got this all wrong. Aging is a disease and we'll cure it. And I thought, well, that took some guts. Either you had no idea what room you were standing in and you hadn't been paying very much attention for the last couple hours, or that took some real guts. But that is part of the crux of the matter, is how do you frame this issue? And in Silicon Valley, can Google solve death? Now, I know that's just a magazine cover, but if you really think about this mindset, it's the same thing you find with geoengineering. Think about that for a moment. Well, modernity and industrialization has put us in this climate mess. Rather than pull back from consumption, we're going to double down. And we're going to put things in the sky that reflect, you know, the light. And we're going to have little nano vacuums that suck the carbon out of the air. Think about de-extinction. Well, we have a terrible extinction crisis. I know. Let's learn how to bring them back. This, to me, seems to be falling into that same sort of space where there's this hubristic notion that somehow death is an engineering problem. And if it's an engineering problem, Google's right, ready to go, right? So what do we do with all that? Well, Peter Thiel made his fortune off of PayPal. He's now very well connected to the Trump administration. And I don't mean to criticize the man necessarily. I've seen him say this more than once. And it's truly deeply felt for him. I've always had this really strong sense that death was terrible, and I prefer to fight it. A Silicon Valley commentator put it slightly differently when he wrote, one thing multi-billionaires hate is dying. Right? It just somehow offends them. Now, Peter Thiel has said this, death offends me. Right? And I think Sean Parker even gets closer to one of the core political questions, right? which is now I want to segue into that. He said quite clearly at a conference on cancer research, and he was a president of Facebook. He himself has made quite a fortune. 
The disparity of wealth in the United States will create a class of immortal overlords. Now, I don't know if he endorses that idea or if that for him is just a statement of fact. Right, so I don't mean to editorialize about the statement, but just as it sits there on that slide, that tells me we've moved into a very interesting new political space. Because I am a billionaire, I'm going to have access to better health care. So I'm going to be like 160, and I'm going to be a part of this class of immortal overlords, which I suppose presumably means that the rest of us are in some form, some new aging form of the Hunger Games where we may get to battle it out to be invited to the table where we get the placenta stem cell injections. But if, again, without editorializing, because I don't know if he endorses this view or is just putting this view forward, when we think about the growing inequalities, certainly in the United States, but it's not the only country, and we think about the notion that time and age themselves become something that distinguishes classes of people. Now, we know it's just had an effect. There's always been a correlation. But truly, this age extension or immortality becomes something that only, only the few, few people that are billionaires could even begin to think about. I think that's quite reflective of our moment, and I think it's something we want to think about before too much more research. I don't mean to stop research, I don't want to be the research czar, but I do think society needs to have a discussion and become more aware of this search for radical age extension or immortality. So immortality for the rest of us. We don't have much data, but I do want to mention the Pew Research Foundation study from 2013. We're going to circle back around to this. The blue column, individuals were asked, do you personally want medical advances that would allow you to live to 120? So they were asked if they thought they would want that and how they thought other people would feel about it. And I think it's quite interesting to realize that only a third of the respondents say that they would want that personally, but they anticipate that over two thirds of everybody else does want it. So clearly, this is just one study, but it suggests there might be a bit of a mismatch that maybe there's a bit more commonality once we get outside the techno-futuristic you know, world that is Silicon Valley. Another interesting, I think it's fascinating, and this is why I asked you, if you do not mind sharing, was there anybody who in their mind was 78 or less? Interesting. I see some very young faces. I'm not gonna like call them out here, but the faces that are putting up their hands look to me like they're somewhere in their late teens or early 20s. I think that's interesting. Uh, what about the 79 to 100? Okay, you reflect that absolutely. Look, only 4%. Think of the money that is being spent. Think of the political power that is pushing this agenda that we've just talked about. And yet only 4% of those in this very well done study want to live to 101 to 120, and only 4% can envision or think they would even want to live to be over 120 years old. And then finally, when you talk to people outside the Silicon Valley bubble, as Pew did, what would a future with radical life extension look like? Agree or disagree with each statement? Well, four-fifths, give or take, felt that everybody should be able to get treatments. Now, I do wonder about that 19% who said, no, they shouldn't. You know, I just kind of wonder about that. I understand that we may have some discussions about how you fund it, what the criteria are, but the fact that 19% of respondents said no, not everyone should get to have this, I find interesting. Clearly a concern that only the wealthy would have access. Scientists will offer this before the health effects are known. 
longer life will strain natural resources. And you don't hear that much in the pro-longevity debate. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And then over half, there's just something fundamentally unnatural about it. There's something that just doesn't feel right, if you will, about this pursuit to artificially, radically extend the human lifespan. So as we're trying to pull this moment together, some patterns that I think we want to think about, and this is where, again, it connects to the politics of it all. Now, I've been predominantly critical, but I do want to pause for a moment. Why not? We live in a world where the body is becoming a site right, of manipulation. We've been living with that for quite some time, but it's accelerating now. It's reaching a sort of tipping point. And I don't think it is any accident that in many countries, including New Zealand, a very serious debate on euthanasia is happening at the same time that some are arguing, okay, maybe not everybody approves of it. Maybe you would rather I use my money differently. But in a free society, I choose to do this. This is a political statement that I am making, right? Because human freedom suggests the right to also pursue this, if this is what I choose to do. Again, we've talked about this before, but the aging is a disease, death is an engineering problem. This notion that it is solvable somehow, that technology and engineering, as they have in so many other sectors, but when we start thinking about the crises we are in, again, the climate crisis, the extinction crisis, is that the best framework to bring to these questions? Because an engineering framework, and I grew up, I'm the daughter of an engineer who worked on the Apollo project. I respect engineers. I think that mindset brings many, many, many positive things to society. But the problem with the way that the Silicon Valley billionaires tend to, again, punch above their weight class is it becomes the only way to think about the issue. And so culture, psychology, emotions, history, right? Religion, spirituality, all the various ways we could think about it, they tend to kind of just get moved over here into the too hard basket and we'll just, this will be a moonshot. You know, if we just work on it long enough with enough smart people and dedication and money, we'll crack it. And when we do, that's going to move the world forward. OK, I know, especially if we have some philosophers in the room who are about to attack me over the, attack me over the mind-body problem, this is very controversial, obviously. Do we even have a soul? Do we have even an identity? Or is it all just kind of electrical back and forth impulses that when you die, they just stop? So, I recognize that there is a massive debate to be had here. But even if we don't take it that far, I think we need to pause and consider how the digital world that we are now immersed in, oh, now we're back to Mary Shelley. That boundary between life and death and identity and immortality does seem to be shifting again. So with due respect for how controversial and fraught the neuroscience and philosophical debate can be, just think for a moment of all the footprints that you have left on social media. It is anticipated that by 2030 there will be more accounts of dead people on Facebook than there are of live people. And if you don't have the password or the author delegated authority to take that site down, the companies have proven a bit reluctant to take down the sites of those who have passed on. Now, the reason for this is data is the currency. 
of the world we live in, and there's still data there. There's pictures to be mined. There's messages that got sent. There are people that got friended. There's tweets that got liked. So we are moving into a space, even if we don't have to go so far as the brain downloading, where I do think we're all having to come to grips with the ethics and the culture and the reality that life and death does seem to be, if you will, a bit porous again. And the question of digital immortality is not I think it's quite a quite serious question. I don't know if any of you have had that experience, but very briefly, I had the experience. Someone very close to me passed away recently, and on LinkedIn, their site came up. Well, all their connections were there, their work history, photographs, and I thought, oh, okay, that was unexpected. So I do, you know, we've talked a lot about science and I've talked about some writers. I also want to talk about artists. And if you have a moment at some point, I certainly want to say thank you to Evan McDougall, who allowed me to use this image in this talk. And he's a graphic designer. And the project portfolio that you can find easily on the web is the Eon Project. And he admits that it's very futuristic. He admits that you know he's kind of projecting into a future and certain technological things that will have to happen. But this is his vision, which I find quite compelling, quite evocative, of what digital immortality might look like. And the concept, the artistic concept, is when you pick up this piece of glass right, that has the electricity moving through it, it warms up. So it becomes almost a living urn. But that information, the data in that, is every memory, every message, again, every tweet, anything that can be pulled right, algorithmically could theoretically create a kind of immortality. And again, if you go back to the Facebook example, what do we do? with these people that have passed on, but in a sense, are, I mean, there's a moment where the pause stops. But they're still there in some sort of cyberspace sort of form. One other example, and then I'll pull it together, leave some time for some questions. This is in beta form, and they're looking for volunteers. I can't vouch for them, but I do find the project concept to be fascinating. This is a potential startup called Eternamy. And when you volunteer for it, you're in a sense signing up for that pulling of all that digital data on you, a sort of digital portfolio of you that's gonna, it's gonna follow you. There'll be a little patch, right, in its perfectly realized form, that as you go about your daily business, is you're being digitized. Your feelings, your thoughts, your emotions, right, Certainly the things that we can actually get to, messages, communication, and the like. So again, I think the digitization issue is one that, yes, you can get onto some really shaky philosophical and scientific ground. It's a deeply, deeply complex issue. But again, we don't have to go all, all the way there to start thinking about these forms of digital immortality and what they might mean for us. And then finally, to go back to my very first point, yes, immortality, it's just our concern with it, life, death, it's one of the most human things about us. And it's one of the most ancient. But if we stay with this notion that this focus on immortality tends to become very salient, very visible in moments of great stress, well, then I would argue it's no accident it's come back around on our watch. I mean, again, it's, you know, one can crack jokes about the current American situation, and sometimes you have to to keep from despairing. But I have said to a bunch of 19-year-olds who were taking American government, and I realized that these new crop of second-year students, virtually all of them were born in the year 2000. I thought, oh my goodness, you don't remember the Apollo Project. 
You don't remember the Cold War. You don't remember Bill Clinton, even. The only America you've ever known is the one that started with George W. Bush. Wow, right? And I have to tell them, you know, you don't want to overdraw the parallels, but certain ideas are circling back around. I'm, you know, not necessarily into the mainstream, but they are visible in a way they haven't been in quite some time. The alt-right, fascism, nationalism, so we know that we're a society where sort of the political center seems to be under an extraordinary amount of stress. And then I think even if that does not move you, surely there is some link between this desperate search for age extension and some form of immortality and the reality of climate change. And I don't know how many of you saw this piece of news. Did any of you see this on this Icelandic iceberg? They've actually put up a memorial for future generations. One of the first Icelandic iceberg that has been scientifically documented has now disappeared due to climate change. And in Iceland, I don't know if you can see it, but it says this is the first Icelandic glacier. This was the first Icelandic glacier to lose its status as a glacier. We want to ensure that others do not follow the same path. Only you will know if we did it. So it's a letter, in a sense, to the future. And again, if we think of World War I, spiritualism, Mary Shelley's time, and Frankenstein's monster, the 30s, Right, and oh, maybe we can go to space. Maybe we can, you know, freeze our heads. Mutual assured destruction. Maybe we can freeze our bodies and buy ourselves some time. And we'll be way down there in that bunker where it's all really cold, even if the nuclear weapons go off. So maybe, or maybe if we eject ourselves into space. And again, it's, you can say you just be dismissive, but I think those are things to take quite seriously. And I think in our moment, this juxtaposition of a world in which on the one hand, many of us, you see the Extinction Rebellion movement, the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement. If we survive another 200, 300 years, I think cultural historians will find that quite important. So on the one hand, we had a human extinction movement, and then on the other hand, we had Google thinking it was gonna solve death. That seems to tell me something kind of important about the stressors that we are living under in this particular moment. So talked about a lot of writers, scientists, and the like, and I want to leave the last word to a musician, Miles Davis. Time isn't the main thing, it's the only thing. So pay attention to it and use it wisely, was what he was saying. So I'll stop there and see if we have any questions. Thank you very much. Question up there. Sorry, can you raise your hand so I can orient myself to where you are? Oh, great, thank you. basic concerns about that were, first of all, that they'd rushed into it with no regulation. And when you get to blood safety, certainly that's a major issue for the FDA. So they felt that, one, it was junk science. They were not remotely persuaded that this was a reasonable thing for people to be doing. And that without proper regulation, you could be putting people in danger with bloodborne diseases and illnesses. Hello.
I agree, and the question was even, you know, let's say, and it seems like there may be possibilities, that we do decode the cellular aging process, but true immortality would not mean anything without memories. So you're right, so much of the 20th century, the focus was on the body. Now, this is why the neuroscience space is really where most of the serious and cutting edge money is going for exactly that reason. And that then, part of the answer to your question in the interest of time, but you're absolutely right. So that's the first thing. It doesn't mean anything if the memories don't travel with you or that what is it that makes you you, your memories, your sense of time passing, you know, all those things. So to use their lingo, we've got the meat puppets focusing on the body. We've got the robocops focusing on downloading ourselves into a computer or possibly the cloud. And then there's a new research strand, which I do need to do more reading on, but there's a new research strand that's studying the way, have you ever had one of those dreams where it felt like 15 years passed and you realized it had been in the 10 minutes that you hit the snooze button? Right, there are neuroscientists beginning to say that we might achieve immortality by manipulating our sense of time. We slow it down. You would still be there, but your experience of time would change dramatically. Now, again, we need some real neuroscientists in here to speak to the plausibility of that, but I think it's a fascinating idea. And you're absolutely right. I think. You think of someone like Shakespeare or even Miles Davis, people who've achieved immortality in the works that they've left behind, and even for the non-famous. Well, the people I care about who've passed on are, in a sense, immortal to me. And if I then, you know, share that with my children, etc. So I think part of the answer to your comment, you're absolutely right. What kind of immortality is it that we're seeking? And in Silicon Valley, if you want to be a cynic, we have people now who have such unprecedented levels of money that they would need six lifetimes to spend it all. <laughs> and yes, there seems to be a substitution just for the challenge of it, just because I want it, not necessarily because I wrote Hamlet, or not necessarily because this group of students you know, may not remember my name, but somehow what you said, you know, becomes a part of their lives and then it becomes a part of the people that they meet. So again, you're right, we could go with that for hours, but I think it's a very good point. What kind of immortality matters? Shakespeare's kind of immortality? Or Jeff Bezos managing to live to be 500 years old? No offense to Jeff Bezos, by the way, if we, <laughs> if we are being taped here. The gentleman up the back. There went that grant. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad for me. Yeah. We can take one more, and then I'll stay. If, you, if anybody wants to come down and talk, that's great. Or, again, feel free to email me. But I think we've got time for one more. Do one more. The gentleman up the back. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Possibly. I mean, the flip side of it is the whole techno-futurist sort of techno-libertarian mindset that drives a lot of Silicon Valley. Were it to be realized, could end up meaning we have to have massive authoritarian control. 
on how many children people can have, what kind of cars they can drive, where can they live. So there is a bit of a built-in paradox if you begin to focus on the resource question. Now, for people who part of their interest in radical age extension and immortality is embedded in the fact that up to age 60, everything they've tried has been a massive success and now they're a gazillionaire, the notion that you would add limits to that becomes quite problematic. But you're absolutely right. Many bioethicists who are taking the search for, the politics of the search for immortality or radical age extension quite seriously, are beginning to focus on the ways that that could exacerbate other forms of inequality. And it also means that one human, think of the carbon footprint of the average American. And I include myself in that. What, am I just extend that out for another 150 years? So yes, there's not an easy answer to your question, but that's where the political economy of it comes in. And again, that's why I think these ideas deserve a serious hearing. Many of them won't happen tomorrow. Some of them may not happen at all. But the mere fact that powerful people are talking about this as a possibility will shape our politics and it will shape people's notions of what is and isn't possible and who does and does not get to enjoy the fruits of all this technological development. Uh, thank you everybody for coming along this evening. Could we have one final thank you to Amy for her lecture?